speaking of journeys, that's our new series. Anybody gone on a road trip recently? Anybody just raise your hand? Yeah. Isn't it amazing how technology has changed the way we take road trips? See, my wife, she has this little app called Waze, W-A-Z-E. And when I'm driving, I think it, it calms her nerves and I have to look at the road. So she looks at her phone. But it's amazing. That app will tell you everything you need to know about your journey. It will tell you if there's an accident up ahead, if there's congestion up ahead, if there's road construction up ahead. It will even tell you a way to get around it. It will tell you if there's a car broken down on the side of the road a mile ahead. It will tell you if Mr. Policeman is hiding in the trees about a half mile ahead. So you know to slow down. In fact, we were coming down Interstate 40 the other day and it said roadkill one half mile away. I'm thinking, see, roadkill is going to show up on an app. It's got to be significant. I'm thinking elephant. At worst case, Brahma bull, it was a squirrel. I was so disappointed. I rode over that squirrel again. That's how disappointed I was, right? But here's the most amazing thing about taking a road trip, see. You can, you can get your phone, or if you've got a new car, you can talk right to your car. You can tell the car your destination, and that car will say, you have not eight hours and nine minutes until you reach your destination. You will arrive at 7.42 p.m., and it will adjust accordingly as you drive. Now, let me just say, that's not, that's not the way it worked in the old days, okay? In the old days, we used this, it was a piece of paper, and it had different color lines on it. It was called a map, M-A-P, map. For you millennials, you're, you're familiar with a map because you watched Dora the Explorer. It's the map, it's the map, it's the map. So we're, we're, we're grateful for Dora, right? So, but here's the problem. With a map, you didn't know what was in the road up ahead. You didn't know if there was construction. You didn't know if there was, what, what was congestion. You didn't know. So you didn't really know when you were going to get to where you were going. And so there was a question that as kids we used to ask our parents. I think it was specifically designed to irritate them. You know what it is, aren't you? Are we there yet? Are we there yet? But imagine going on a trip. And you have to answer that question, are we there yet? You have to answer it this way. Nope, we're not there yet. And not only are we not there yet, we're not gonna get there today. And we're not gonna get there tomorrow. In fact, we're not even gonna get there in this lifetime. And I tell you that because in the same way as Christians, I've got some good news for you and I got some bad news for you. The good news is this, our spiritual journey that God is taking us on, I'm telling you, we are definitely heading for a destination that is worth traveling to. The bad news is this, we're not gonna get there in our lifetime. So it is gonna require incredible patience, incredible faith to be able to stick with the journey. And that's what we're gonna be talking about in this series. How do we develop that kind of faith? And we're gonna base our series on the life of Abraham. If you've ever read it, it really is a story of faith. And in this series, we're going to discover from Abraham's life how we can become people of faith. Or I like to say how we can develop our faith muscle. We all, most of us, we have a faith muscle that's underdeveloped. We gotta develop it. And let me tell you why this is so important. It's important because, see, as Christians, I want us to be able to face the reality that we live in a not-there-yet world. I mean, think about it. See, when we become Christians, we want to be sanctified now. See, we just spent a series talking about how God takes us on a project to conform us to the image of Jesus Christ. Let's be honest. We don't want to work at it. We want to be conformed now. We want to be saved from sin, free from sin right now. We want to be free from suffering and pain right now. In fact, for the average American Christian, we want to experience heaven now. It's one of our biggest challenges. I mean, think of how much time, how much energy, how much of our resources we tend, we use trying to manipulate and, and structure our lives in such a way that we have no pain, no suffering. We want heaven now. Listen, heaven comes later. The life that, that we have right now, the 70, the 80, the 90 years, it's about the journey right now. It's to a destination that we will not get there into this lifetime. And that means it's going to require us to learn to trust God even when it makes no sense to trust God, even when it makes no sense to follow God, even when it makes no sense even to be faithful. So that's what we're going to be doing. I want to start by looking at a passage. Don't even have to turn there yet. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1. The writer of Hebrews gives us this definition of faith. He says, now faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. This is what the ancients, those would be the Old Testament saints, this is what the ancients were commended for. And then the writer of Hebrews begins to talk about some of these ancients, these Old Testament saints, but his primary example is Abraham. This is what he says in verse eight. By faith, Abraham, when called to go to a place he would later receive as his inheritance, obeyed and went, even though he did not know where he was going. 
By faith, he made his home in the promised land like a stranger in a foreign country. He lived in tents. He didn't build a big estate. He lived in tents, as did Isaac and Jacob, who were heirs with him of the same promise. For he was looking forward to the city with foundations, whose architect and builder is God. Now drop down to verse 13. All these people, all of these ancients, all of these Old Testament saints were still living by faith when they died. They did not receive the things promised. In other words, they lived a not there yet kind of life. They only saw them and welcomed them from a distance, admitting, look at this, that they were foreigners and strangers on earth. Verse 16, instead, they were longing for a better country. They were longing for a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. But what I want you to notice here is that Abraham identifies himself on this earth as a foreigner and a stranger. His attitude is, I'm just passing through. Like the opener of the Tom Petty song, you know, I'm just running down a dream. It won't become a reality in this life. I'm just chasing. In other words, he knew that he was on a pilgrimage. He knew that his life was going to be one long, not there yet. Now this week, we're gonna look at the beginning of Abraham's journey. So if you do have your Bible, this would be the place to turn. Genesis chapter 12. If you didn't bring your Bible or you didn't bring your phone, we're gonna put it up on the screens. And let me just say something about the place of this story about Abraham in the book of Genesis. When you get to Genesis chapter 12, it kind of marks a new phase in God's relationship with mankind. Up to this part in the book of Genesis, the writer has been talking in these great sweeping universal terms. He's talked about the creation of the world. He's talked about the creation of mankind. He talks about how God has this dream of what the world is supposed to be like. But then you get to Genesis chapter three, just three chapters in, and Adam and Eve sin, and they usher in the fall. And all of a sudden, everything comes crashing down. Now think about this. There's 1,189 chapters in the Bible. 1,189. By the time we get six chapters in, we're just six chapters in. This is what it says in Genesis chapter six, verse five. The Lord saw how great the wickedness of the human race had become on the earth, and every inclination of the thoughts of the human heart was only evil all the time. The Lord regretted that he had made human beings on the earth, and his heart was deeply troubled. And we're only six chapters in. But see, when you read that, you think, well, wait a second. What about God's dream? What about this relationship that God longs to have with his prized creation, mankind? You read that and you think, has God's patience, has it been exhausted? Is he finished? Is he done? Is the dream lost forever? And so the writer of Genesis, he begins to answer those questions. And all of a sudden in Genesis 7, we meet a guy named Noah. You know that story. And God says, listen, Noah, I want you to build a boat. It's got to be a big boat. I want you to build an ark. And once it's built, I want you to get your family on the ark and I want you to get these animals on the ark and I'm gonna send a flood and I am going to destroy the rest of the earth. And sure enough, it rains 40 days and 40 nights and it floods. And a lot of people believe on the 41st day, you know, Noah walked out of the ark, but that's not true. He was actually in the ark for a year because he had to wait for the waters to recede. And then it tells us in Genesis, two years after they got out of the ark, Shem, who was one of Noah's sons, he had a son. And that began the lineage of Shem. About 300 years after that, in the lineage of Shem, all of a sudden, in Genesis chapter 11, there's a name that appears. The name is Terah. Terah has a son whose name is Abram. Later on, his name is going to be changed to Abraham. You got to understand, this is pivotal. This This is the turning point for the rest of the Bible. Because right now, this begins a new chapter in God's relationship with mankind. You know why? It's because God had a dream. And God refuses to give up on his dream. And so you're going to see he takes this very, very fallible nomad named Abraham. And he says, guess what, Abraham? I'm going to work through you. You're going to be the beginning of a new community. In fact, you're going to be the beginning of a new nation. Now, this is what I want to do this weekend as we get into the the beginning of this story. I want us to talk about four things that we can learn from Abraham in regards to us being able to have have the kind of faith we need to have to go with God on the journey that he desires to take us on. Let me give you the first thing uh, we learn about Abraham's journey of faith, and then we'll unpack it. It's this. If we're going to be people of faith, we got to get to the point in our lives where we hold everything loosely. And if if we're really going to be committed to traveling with God, we got to hold everything 
loosely. Let me show you Genesis chapter 12, verse 1. The Lord has said to Abram, go from your country, your people, your father's household to the land I will show you. In other words, God says, Abraham, I want you to leave everything that you're familiar with. I want you to turn your back on everything that you're familiar with, and I'm going to take you to a brand new, unfamiliar place. And it's really, really hard for us to appreciate this because, you know what, we live in such a mobile society. For example, raise your hand if you now live 100 miles away from where you were born. Just raise your hand. See, look at that. I'm telling you, that was unheard of in Abraham's day. In Abraham's day, you, you were born, you lived, you died in the same place. You knew the same people your entire life. But God says to Abraham, not so fast, Abraham, not for you. You're going to leave everything you're familiar with, and you're going to go to a land that I'm going to show you. By the way, let me just say, at this point in the story, God doesn't give Abraham a whole lot of details about this journey. You know, There's not a whole lot of information that he can give to his wife, Sarah. Wives tend to want to know about these kinds of things, right? And I'll never forget when I, I first got this, this great idea to walk away from all of our security in the Bay Area of California and move back here and start Hope Community Church. But at that time, I didn't really know that I was gonna move back here to start Hope Community Church. I just thought God wanted me to start a church. So I'm having dinner with the Lord and I say, hey, how would you feel if, if we get rid of this beautiful house and the pool and the trips to Hawaii and all of these things that we get to and we just go start life all over? Let's go start a church. No. <laughs> and I said, well, come on. Why? She said, where would you go? This is no lie. I thought, maybe Dallas? Because, see, I'm a Cowboy fan. That's, that's how spiritual I am. I'll go to Dallas. I'm a Cowboy fan. Made sense to me, right? And she said, well, where else? I said, I don't know. North Carolina sounds like a lot of people are moving back there. Maybe, maybe we go there. She said, well, where would we live? I don't know. Well, you don't have a church. How are you going to put food on the table? I don't know. Well, you know, the kids have always been in Christian school. What are we going to do about that? I don't know. Are we going to health insurance? I don't know. I don't know, see? So this may be, see, this, Sarah, she doesn't know what's going on. This may be the only time in, his, in the history of the human race when a wife could say to her husband, do you have any idea where you're going? And Abraham could honestly respond with a big smile on his face, not a clue. You see, only God knew the destination. And I guarantee you at some point in the journey, she said, could you at least pull over and get directions? But see, it doesn't work in this case. I mean, imagine that, pulling over in the gas station, hey, Hey, my name is Abraham. Could you help me get to where I'm going? Where do you want to go? Don't know. Only God knows. See, that's not going to go down very well. So Abraham, all he had was God. I want you to follow me to a place I'm going to take you. So he had to hold tightly to God, which means he had to hold loosely to everything else. Now, if you were writing this message, this is where you would have written this question. Okay. What are you holding on to so tightly that it is preventing you from fully trusting God for the journey that he wants to take you on? I mean, we'll talk about this in the series, but it could be possessions, it could be prestige, it could be your reputation, it could be your security, it could be a relationship. But what are you holding on so tightly that is keeping you from fully holding on to God? So you got something in this arm, and then you're trying to grab God with this hand. What is it that's keeping you from trusting God for the unique journey that he has designed specifically for you? By the way, that doesn't mean that you have to take a vow of poverty. We're going to see next weekend in, in chapter 13 of Genesis that Abraham was a very, very wealthy man, but yet he held things loosely. Our problem is we get so attached to our stuff, it often prevents us from following God to where he wants to take us. See, the writer of Hebrews says it. these people of faith, they don't get overly attached to stuff. They don't get attached to things like money and success and comfort and security. They refuse to get attached to anything that would interfere with the journey to the destination, see that God has planned specifically for them. Let me tell you something, and maybe you never thought of it this way. If you are a Christian, if you've accepted Jesus Christ as your first personal savior, if you've accepted God's free gift of salvation, understand this world is not your home. You gotta understand that. This world is not your final destination. You're no different from Abraham. You're a foreigner, you're a stranger, you're just passing through. Listen, you're on a journey of faith to the kind of life that God, not us, that God wants us to experience. And at some point, you have to sacrifice the life that you want to experience for the life that God wants you to experience. But to be able to do that, you're gonna have to figure out how to travel lightly. You're gonna have to hold things loosely. Here's the second thing. We need to learn to see the goodness of God. I mean, think about it. 
God gives this command to Abraham. I want you to go to this land that I'll show you. And Abraham just obeys. And then God gives him a promise in verse 2. I will make you into a great nation. I will bless you. I will make your name great. And you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you. And whoever curses you, I will curse. And all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. Now look at that verse. Leave it up just for a second. What's the word that appears over and over in that verse? It appears five times a different tr a version of that word. What? What is it? Bless, yeah, bless, bless, you know, blessing, I will bless you, you will be a blessing, all peoples on earth will be blessed by you. And I point that out because I really do believe that this word bless, we don't understand in our culture, but I believe the word bless best describes the heart and the desire of God. I believe that it motivates all of his actions. In fact, when you think about it this way, this promise in verse two and three that he gave Abraham, this is the promise that forms the covenant for all people of God. I mean, think about this. God is going to begin this new little family with Abraham. This family, over time, is going to grow into a nation of people. It's going to, it's going to grow into the nation of the Jews. And from this Jewish nation, this nation of Israel, over time, is going to come Jesus Christ, the Messiah, the Lord, the Savior of the world. And from Jesus Christ, the Savior of the world, Acts 2 tells us, his church, that's us, is going to be born. So when you think about it, what we see here in Genesis chapter 12, this is a covenant for you and me also. I mean, it is for all of us. It's right here. By the way, I think that we sometimes get confused when we, when we talk about this whole chosen people thing. I think when we talk about the idea that when the Bible talks about Israel being God's chosen people, we're like, ooh, favorites, you know, or, you know, teacher's pet, you know. And again, God can do anything he wants to do. He's God, but it just seems a little weird that God would have his pets, right, that he would have his favorites. But the key phrase in this promise comes at the end of verse 3. Look what it says. And all peoples on earth will be blessed through you, Abraham. Everyone's going to be blessed through you, Abraham. One Old Testament scholar puts it like this. The primary motive behind the call of Abraham is God's desire to bring blessing rather than cursing on the families of the earth. The promise that Abraham will become a great nation, implying both numerous descendants and land, must be understood as being subservient to God's principal desire. God's principal desire is to bless all the families of the earth. And the way that God is going to bless all the families of the earth is he is going to be Jesus Christ, our Savior, our Lord, through the lineage of Abraham. In other words, the proclamation of good news. And what does good news mean in the New Testament? It means the gospel. The proclamation of the good news, the gospel, the idea that God is going to provide a way of salvation. God is going to be, provide a way for mankind to be restored, reconciled back into a relationship with him. The proclamation of the gospel has been a part of God's plan from the very, very beginning. So understand, in Genesis 12, God isn't just choosing Israel. God is choosing the world. God is choosing all the families of the earth. This theme runs throughout the entire Bible. In fact, it goes right up to the book of, of Revelation where John is having this vision. Christ has returned. He set up his kingdom on earth. You get to Revelation 7 verse 9. This is what John says. After this I looked and there in front of me was a huge crowd of people. They stood in front of the throne. That would be the throne of Jesus Christ. In front of the Lamb. There were so many that no one could count them. They came from every nation, tribe, and people. My point is this. God's great longing and desire is to bless the world, to bless the people of the world, to bless all the families of the world. That is his desire. And so God says to Abraham, listen, I'm going to form my people through you. But I want it clearly understood from the beginning that the purpose of this new community, the purpose of this new nation is to bless all the people of the earth. But this is what I want you to see. I want you to see that one of the reasons why Abraham is able to trust God for the journey is because he is, he's utterly convinced to the core of his being that the God that he is going to follow is a God of blessing. And that's important because I'll tell you, if you're not convinced of that, you won't persevere on your journey. You won't make it on your journey that God wants to take you on. You'll drop out at some point. So the, the idea of blessing, you gotta, it, is, it is essential. It's an essential part of God's relationship 
with us. In fact, let me just show you something maybe you've never thought about before. Genesis chapter one, God creates the heavens and the earth, the land, the sea, the sun, the moon, the animal, the fish, the birds, the turtles, the black widows, you know, the little earthworms. God creates it all. Then when you get down to verse 27 of Genesis chapter one, what does God do? He creates mankind. He creates Adam and Eve. I want you to notice the very first thing that God does after he creates Adam and Eve. Look at Genesis chapter one, verse 28. God blessed them. He created them. He blessed them. Let me ask you a question. What had Adam and Eve done to deserve to be blessed? They hadn't done anything. I mean, Adam is just standing in the garden like, wow, I have been created. And then he sees Eve. Wow, wow, wow. You were really created. I mean, that's the other thing. We were created. God's like, yep, you are created. And now I'm going to bless you. And I guarantee you they thought, well, don't we need to do something to deserve to be blessed? Don't we need to earn that blessing? God's like, nope, I just want to bless you. And I point this out because, see, I think we have the idea sometimes that God just kind of sits up in heaven and he's like, if you behave, I'll bless you. You screw up, I will curse you. And it doesn't really matter to me which way you go. I can go either way. I can bless you and I'm cursed. I'm good either way. That is not God's heart. I'm telling you, God has an insatiable desire to bless us. Now, I know what some of you are thinking. I don't feel very blessed. Well, you know what? Maybe one of the best things you can do as we approach this Thanksgiving season is maybe get a journal. Journal's a wonderful thing. And over the next few weeks, just start spending some time thinking through how God has actually blessed you. You know, Maybe you're in a great small group and God has blessed you through that small group. Maybe you went online and you started checking out the Anchored series and now you're learning some things about the foundation of your faith and, and it's opening your eyes and all of a sudden you feel like, wow, God has blessed me. Or maybe another ministry at Hope Community Church or maybe God has just placed some significant people in your life that have blessed you. Or maybe God has given you a job. Maybe you have good health. Maybe God has blessed you financially. But I'll tell you this, if you can't think of anything, you can remember that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son so that you would have a savior so that your sins could be forgiven, so that you could be reconciled back into a relationship with him, so you could live the abundant life now that Jesus came for you to experience. And as a cherry on top, when you take your last breath on this earth, you reach your final destination. You get to spend all eternity with God in heaven. Let me tell you something. People of faith are people that have been seized by the conviction that God is a good God and his desire is to bless us. The third characteristic of people of faith is this sounds kind of weird. We build altars. We build altars. If you look at Genesis chapter 12, again, you'll see Abraham's obedience. Yes, God, I'll follow you. And then God makes him this wonderful promise. We just saw it in verses two and three. And then immediately, Abraham's faith is tested. And the test is to see if Abraham is willing to give up everything to follow God. Does he really trust God? By the way, you'll see this pattern all through this series. It's all through. God comes along and says, hey, this is what I'm going to do for you. Awesome. Now I'm going to test you. In fact, as we'll see in a few weeks, the story reaches a climax when Abraham is tested to see if he really trusts God enough to let go of his own son. It's an incredible story. I can't wait to get to that point. But let me show you how God appears to Abram and confirms his promise in verse 7. The Lord appears to Abram and says, to your offspring, I will give this land. So he builds an altar there. By the way, if you ever wonder why there's so much conflict in the Middle East over land, this is why. This is why. The Jews, it says right here in Genesis chapter 12, right? You know what I'm saying? So anyway, to your offspring, I will give the land. So he built an altar there to the Lord who had appeared to him. From there, he went on toward the hills east of Bethel, pitched his tent with Bethel on the west, I on the east. There he built an altar to the Lord and called on the name of the Lord. Now, by the way, when you think of an altar, what do you think about? Dead animal. But we just saw in our last series that Romans chapter 12, one and two, we are called to crawl up on the altar and present our bodies as a living Sacrifice. So really, when you think about altar, think it's a place of sacrifice. Sometimes it's a place of prayer. It's a play, place of worship. And we see two of them listed here in verses 7 and 8. Later on, you're going to see that uh, we're told that Abraham, he builds an altar at Hebron. Later on in the story, he builds an altar at Mount Moriah. And these altars become places where Abraham, when he sees his little boy Isaac playing, or his grandson Jacob playing, or his great-grandson Joseph playing, he remembers, oh yeah, God is faithful to his promise. He said he was going to build a nation through me, and I'm seeing it unfold in front of my very eyes. Now, I know this sounds like a strange question, 
But are you building altars in your life? And I'm not saying go home, get a truckload of stone dumped in your front yard. I'm not talking about that. I'm confident that Kerry uh, has ordinances against that. You cannot build altar. (laughs) And I guarantee you, if I built an altar in my front yard in 12 Oaks, neighborhood Facebook page would explode. Everybody would have an opinion about my altar, right? When I talk about altars, I'm talking about altars we build in our mind. I'm talking about altars we build in our hearts that remind us of God's faithfulness on the journey. I got a few I remember here when we finally did move from California and we left all of our security and we moved into a little bedroom, a two-bedroom apartment on Chatham Boulevard at Brampton Moors and the clubhouse was nice enough to let me start the church in the clubhouse. We were a couple of months in, no one had come, no one had shown up, it was just those of us who had started the church. And I remember it was one of those cloudy, kind of cool mornings, uh, probably around March. And I remember walking outside of that clubhouse and I thought, God, Did I miss something? I mean, did I just have a bad pizza and I interpreted that as, you know, you wanted me to move here and and I'm like, God, I know know you have to do this, but man, I just, anything, just throw me a bone, any kind of sign. And no sooner had I looked up, a car pulled into the, we only had about 12 parking spots, car pulled in that I didn't recognize and a couple got out that the night before I had met, it used to be a Ryan Steakhouse over here at Crossroads, and standing in line, they said, what, what moved you here? I said, I'm starting a church. We had about a 30-second conversation. I told them we met in the Brampton Moore Clubhouse, and God brought them the next day. And for years, that family was a vital part of our church. But you know what? When I get discouraged, there's sometimes I go back to that altar, and I remember God's faithfulness. So my office is here at the Raleigh campus, and it's up on the second floor, and it's got it's windows that just faces out to the parking lot. And sometimes when I'm in a daze, I just stare at the parking lot, and But then sometimes, sometimes I don't see the parking lot. You know what I see? I remember years ago when we were in the fire trap on Chapel Hill Road when someone told us that there might be a businessman who wants to give this piece of property to a church. The very next day on Sunday afternoon, we went to Jeff and Becky Nielsen's house. That's one of the families that moved here with me from California. We had a barbecue. We were gonna gonna watch some football or something. And I think it was us and maybe Tom and Cindy Mitchell, my sister and brother-in-law who helped me start the church. And I think maybe Kathy and and Rich Whittemore were there. It was just a few of us, right? And I was telling them about this property and I said, hey, you know what we ought to do? Let's go pray on that property. And in those days, it was just a big old mound of dirt. In fact, Mr. Martin used to kind of hide some of his old equipment up here and it kind of looked like a junkyard, you know? And we climbed up to the top of that hill and we held hands right out there with now a parking lot. And we said, God, if you'll give us this campus, if you'll give us this property, we will do our best to build a church that will bring honor and glory to you. And sometimes when I feel like I'm losing my way or we're losing our way or I'm losing the vision, I look out there and I don't see a parking lot. I I see a mound of dirt with some people standing on it and I'm reminded of God's faithfulness. See, that's an altar. It's one of the reasons we get together on the weekend. Man, we devote time to worship and we sing and we get some teaching, but see what happens? You know, every once in a while, we have one of those moments. Lots of time I have them during the music. I just, I need that moment where God's spirit connects with my spirit and I'm just reminded of his faithfulness and his goodness. See, that's happened to some of you. And that's so important because, see, you have those kinds of stories, and when you get discouraged, you can be reminded of how God showed up and met your needs. See, it's just, it's just a little altar that's built in your heart that you carry around with you so you can remember that God is good, God is faithful, God is trustworthy. He did it in the past. He'll show up. He'll do it again. I'm telling you, people who have enough faith to make it on the journey are people who hold things loosely. They see God as a good God, as a generous God, as a God of blessing, But there are also people who build altars along the way to remind themselves of God's faithfulness. Remind them there isn't a day when he wasn't by my side. There wasn't a day that he let me fall. He'll be faithful. He's been there in the past. He'll He'll show up again. And then the fourth characteristic of people of faith is we just acknowledge along the journey we're still broken. We'll get sanctified when we get to heaven. We'll be conformed to the image of Jesus Christ. That's a prophecy that Paul talked about in Romans chapter 8. But on this journey, we're always gonna be broken. We're gonna have baggage. I know it's not appropriate probably anymore to say it, but we'll have junk in our trunk. You know what I'm saying, right? Now let me just show you why I say that. In the latter part of Genesis 12, there's a famine that takes place in the land. Abraham decides that he's gonna go to Egypt. Now understand, traveling in those days was incredibly dangerous. It was especially dangerous if you were a woman. So if you were a wife and you were traveling, it was kind of critical to you that your husband was gonna protect you and take care of you. You know, you want to know, man, I'm traveling with my husband. I, I want to know he's got some courage, some moxie, some street smart. 
So in the latter part of Genesis 12, Abraham and his wife, they're about to enter Egypt. He says in verse 11, as he was about to enter Egypt, he said to his wife, Sarah, her name's going to be changed to eventually to Sarah. I know what a beautiful woman you are. When the Egyptians see you, they will say, this is your wife. Then they will kill me, but let you live. Say you are my sister so that I will be treated well for your sake and my life will be spared because of you. Now, let me just tell you, if that was what I would have done, well, that would have not instilled a lot of confidence in Laura, okay? Right, she would say, you are a big coward, right? But anyway, that's what Abraham does. I told you, very fallible guy. Verse 14, Abram arrived in Egypt. The Egyptians saw that Sarai was a very beautiful woman. When Pharaoh's officials saw her, they told Pharaoh how beautiful she was. So she was taken into his palace. In other words, she became a part of his harem. Pharaoh treated Abram well, I guess so, because of her. So Abram gained more sheep and cattle and male and female donkeys. Can you imagine Sarah's wife, the conversation between Sarah and Abraham when she got home? Right. He also gained more male and female servants and some camels. Now remember, Sarah is the woman through whom the promise of God is going to be fulfilled also. Let's be honest, it takes two to tango. So she, as much as Abraham is needed in this process of birthing a nation. So Abraham, who's the receiver of the promise, now becomes the enemy of the promise. He short circuits the promise. So God has to get involved, clean up the mess. Verse 17, the Lord sent terrible sickness on Pharaoh and everyone in his palace. The Lord did it because Abram's wife, Sarai. So Pharaoh sent for Abram. What have you done to me, he said. Why didn't you tell me she was your wife? Why did you say she was your sister? That's why I took her to be my wife. Now then, here's your wife, take her and go. Pharaoh gave orders to his men about Abram. They sent him on the way, so he left with his wife and everything he had. I guarantee you there wasn't a whole lot said in the front seat of that station wagon as they were leaving. You know what I'm saying? But what's the writer telling us? Well, a couple of lessons. I mean, let's be honest. If it wasn't for the grace of God getting involved sometimes and cleaning up our mess, we would never be able to stay on our journey. But I think he's also reminding us that every journey is made up of fallible and imperfect men and women. I mean, you don't have to be perfect to go on this journey with God, but you gotta be available. I think God is just looking for people who are honest about where they are and they're just willing to start from there on the journey. He doesn't really care what you've done or what you've been or what you've been up to. He doesn't care what, how big of a mess you've made of your life. He just wants to know if you're available. And I tell you what, he'll take you on a journey. It'll blow your mind. He'll take you on a journey. Now, I need to wrap this up, so let me ask you the question. As we start thinking about this, where are you on the journey? And I think it's safe to say that, you know, the thousands that will listen to this message this weekend, some of you, some of you have been distracted from the journey. Maybe you came out of the gate all jacked up to be a follower of Jesus Christ and you were so excited and so passionate and you felt that God had called you to great acts of love or service or generosity and man, you were all in, you crawled up on the altar, man, I am a living sacrifice, God, just tell me what you want. But somewhere along the way, you got sidetracked. Somewhere along the journey, you crawled down off the altar, you know. And now you're just kind of parked on the side of the road somewhere and you're kind of just sitting there. So this is my prayer for you in this series, that you get back on the journey. And maybe this means you get involved in some ministry in some new way or maybe it means a new adventure in giving or financial sacrifice or maybe, maybe there's that person that's been hanging around you and they don't know Jesus from a lizard and maybe God just wants you to be that person that shares your story of how through Jesus Christ, God changed your life. I don't know what it is, but my prayer for you is pull off the shoulder, get back on the road, get back on the journey to where God has taken you. And then some of you, you've been on the journey so long, <laughs> you're just kind of worn out, right? I mean, the truth is, children or not, it's hard for us to understand we're not there yet. That every day is a journey. And every day requires faith. And let's be honest, sometimes God seems distant. Sometimes God seems very quiet. Sometimes it's dark, and you know he's up there somewhere leading you, but you can't see him. And I don't know what you're like, but when I find myself in those times, and I find them more often than not, you get cranky and tired and frustrated and discouraged. And there's days like, man, is this really worth it? See Gary sitting back over here. Gary's my right-hand man. He is my Jonathan, without a doubt. And one day I just walked into his office. I plopped down on his couch. He said, Mac, how you doing? I said, empty, unmotivated, uninspired. I said, I got to start a new series. I have no idea what I'm going to teach on next year. I don't know what I'm going to do in January. I just feel like I'm absolutely empty. And I said, there are times I think, am I done? Is it worth it? 
And we're going to talk more and more about this throughout the series. But let me just say this. right. Let me make it very, very clear. It's worth it. I don't care how tired it discourages you. It is worth it. In fact, I am more convinced than ever that life's major pursuit it is not the journey to know oneself. It's a journey to really know God. And unless God is the major pursuit of your life, I can just guarantee you this, any other pursuit's gonna end in a dead end street. It'll be a waste of time. It won't bring you fulfillment. I promise you it will not satisfy. Because see, you'll never really begin the process of coming to know yourself until you get on the journey of really getting to know God and to follow him. That's where we're gonna go over the next few weeks. I think it's gonna be a hoot. Don't miss the journey. Let's pray. Just before I do that, let me just say, some of you aren't even on the journey. You hadn't even begun the journey with God. And I want you to know right before I pray that God has made a way for you. Even when Adam and Eve screwed up in the garden, it was God who said, no, 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 no. I created them to be in relationship with them. I want you to know that God is head over heels in love with you, regardless of how you feel about him. And he wants nothing more than to be in a relationship with you. And that's why he gave his most prized possession, Jesus Christ, for you. Because he knew that you needed and I needed and we all need a savior. And when you get to the place in your life where you realize, man, I need saving, you have a savior. He's Jesus Christ the Lord. All of our campuses, we can help you with that. When you leave, just go to the next step calendar. And anyone would be more than happy to sit down with you and share you from God's word how you can begin that journey today to the life that God created you to experience. Father, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your faithfulness. One of the greatest studies in the Bible is the study of all the times where it said, and God was silent. And sometimes it's for a few weeks, and sometimes it may be for 40 years. There's, there's a 400-year period between the Old and the New Testament where you were silent. And God, we often experience that in our lives. But that doesn't mean you're not faithful. And that doesn't mean that you're not right by our side. I thank you for what we're gonna learn and where you're gonna take us over the next few weeks as we go on this journey together. We give you the glory now for what you're gonna do. In your holy name we pray, amen.